Good evening, everyone. My name is Vincent Cirasol, and I want to start by wishing everyone a very happy St. Pat's Day. Um, you had a bio about me on the website that the library published. Uh, it, was, uh, it was fairly accurate. It left out the fact that I have two degrees in education from Columbia University and my specialization was physical education, I, uh, which sensitized me to physical fitness and health and nutrition, et cetera, et cetera. And that's why I do what I do with gardening or with organic gardening. I spent 13 years selling vegetables that I grew in my 16,000 square foot organic garden. I sold the veggies at two farmers markets and at a farm stand. Uh, what I'd like to do at this time is I'd like to share a few pictures of my garden with you. And I'm going to pull those up. Uh, what did I push? Give me a break. I'm, I'm an old timer. Okay. This this girl is so good, I think I'm going to marry her. Okay, now, uh, this is a picture of my seedlings in the greenhouse. Um, I don't know how many there are or were, but there were hundreds of seedlings of all different types. And I built this greenhouse as an attachment onto my garage, and it worked out magnificently for, for years and years. Here uh, you have a sample of my garlic crop. I grew a lot of garlic and uh, this is a, a representation of the, the ones I'm holding. And then in the back, you can see hanging in my garage, uh, many, many, many bundles of garlic curing. This is a picture of my garden. That white building in the background is my garage and the white building behind that garage is my house. That's where I lived. And this garden was in my backyard. Actually, my, my backyard and my neighbor's backyard because after a while I took over his backyard too, with permission. This is my brother pretending that he's working in the garden and he was a big help to me. It's a difficult picture, but I grew my plants on vines, uh, on, on, on a trellis. I grew my, uh, uh, my string beans, my cucumbers, my tomatoes, all on trellises. And you're looking at rows of those three vegetables that are six foot high held up by this trellis. This is a flower bed that I made for my wife in front of the house. Barbara liked these uh, amaranthus flowers. My dad and I standing in my garlic field. And this is me trying to hide in the garlic field. And this is my lovely wife, Barbara, pretending that she likes my garden, which actually she didn't like because I was dragging dirt into her house and I was wasting my time in the backyard there. God bless her. This is a picture of a book I've written. That's the title of the book. Um, it's being, it's for sale publicly. It's being very well received, I'm happy to say. And the library has agreed to sell these, uh, these books. If anyone wants to come to the library, the library has a stack of, of my books and you can buy it just by paying the library and taking the book out. Uh, the books sell in the stores for $30. 
Uh, I'm, I'm discounting for anyone who's taking the course. It's the, the price is $25. I prefer cash. Uh, I also can accept a check, but I don't do anything with electronic money. Okay. Thanks. Now, <clears throat> now I push the button and it may be the wrong one. Uh, thank God for Amy. Okay. <clears throat> I created this course that you're, you're embarking upon with me um, about 12 or 13 years ago. And I've taught it to, over the years, a, a, a thousand adults about. Uh, and you, you, you perform this force in the creatures, you're the latest victims. The course is intended to acquaint you with what plants need in order to thrive. And I want you to know that because that's the basis of what you need to do when you go into the garden. Um, the last thing I want by way of orientation, I want you to know that during each session, I will show a video about how plants live and survive. Believe me, you're going to be astonished by this video. I, I, I don't think you've ever seen anything like it. Uh, <coughs> it. It takes about 30 minutes. Okay, so let's get started. We all know that plants grow in dirt, right? Okay, so if you'll allow me, I'd like to get a little bit more systematic and, and say that plants grow in soil. And when you say, when I say soil, what is soil? What do I, well, once again, soil is composed of a number of living and non-living substances. So living creatures and non-living substances. So for instance, sand, silt and clay are different sized particles which make up soil. In addition, in the spaces in between those particles, there's air and water percolates down into those spaces also, as do minerals and biochar. <coughs> Some of those, some of, all of the above are non-living materials. There's no life in those materials. But we're going to get to some previous living organic matter, stuff we call humus, the leaves from the trees that fell to the ground. For instance, uh, peat moss, manures, these are, uh, also not alive, but they are components of soil. And the better the soil is, the more of certain of these components exists in that soil. And then finally, we have what you're, what you're all somewhat familiar with, which are living organisms in the soil. Uh, has anyone ever seen any insects in the soil? Any bugs, any creepy crawlers? Uh, how about worms? Anybody seen any worms? Worms are at home in the soil. That's where they live. So there are some living creatures in the soil, as well as the substances that I mentioned above. There is an abundance of other living things in the soil, and this is key. These critters are so small that you can only see them with a microscope. They're microscopic critters, but they're alive and they're living their life processes in the soils. And that's how the plants get support from interacting with these living creatures in the soil. And we'll get into detail on it. Uh, some examples, bacteria live in the soil, fungi live in the soil. There's mycorrhizal parasites, which are directly connected to the roots of the plants. Uh, some nematodes, some protozoa, other life forms which are microscopic, 
and which make up soil, along with the other non-living substances we mentioned before, sand, silk, clay, water, minerals, leaves, twigs, peat moss, etc. Once you got that, then I want to be clear that we're talking organic gardening here, and the essence of organic gardening is building and maintaining soil. So that's what I'm going to talk about for the next while. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the motto that I give to my classes and that I think about myself when I'm gardening is build the soil and let it feed your plants. The guy on the TV that wants to sell you a bag of plant food Tell them to stuff it, okay? You want the living creatures in the soil to feed your plants through their roots. And that's what you'll get uh, after I finish going through how to do it. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, the plants will thrive naturally. Uh, the mycorrhizae uh, uh, connect to the roots. Uh, the plants grow hardy uh, when they, they're in rich soil, wholesome soil. Uh, they get larger, they get greener, they get thicker cell walls, which makes it more difficult for insects to attack them. Uh, and, and there are other, other um, benefits that make for healthy plants and healthy plants have stronger disease resistance and stronger resistance to insect attack. So the first line of defense for, from, from troublemakers in your garden is to build healthy soil. There are a number of procedures that are going to, that you're going to do in the garden in order to build healthy soil. One of them is proper seed selection. Make sure you buy organic seeds. Make, make sure you buy uh, open pollinated seeds, which are, which are uh, the kind of seeds that when the plant makes fruit, the seeds inside the fruit can be saved and used next year to start new plants. There are other kinds of plants and there are other kinds of seeds, but they don't reproduce. Hybrid plants grow beautifully, give great fruit, but the seeds from the hydrant plant don't, don't germinate true. Um, <coughs> the, uh, there are now on the market, unfortunately, there are genetically modified seeds. These are seeds which do not occur in nature. They're created in a laboratory. And these seeds also do not reproduce. So every year you have to buy the genetically modified seed from the laboratory that created and patented it. Uh, a good gardening prop procedure is to grow a whole lot of different vegetables. It's called multi-cropping. Plant a lot of different veggies so that there's a variety in your soil and they intermingle and interact with each other, different types. Plus they attract different kind of, of outside um, organisms, uh, birds and, and uh, certain other kind of flying insects and all. All of these things are a part of the whole interaction. So you want to plant a lot of different plants in your garden. Don't do what the industrial agriculture guy does, and he plants 200 acres of corn and nothing but corn. Please, that's the absolute worst thing you could do. That's why they have to bombard the place with poison to, uh, to try to correct that mistake. And all they do actually is make the mistake worse. Okay, next gardening procedure that you need to, to be aware of is called crop rotation. 
don't plant the same plants, the same vegetables in the same place year after year. It's sort of common sense, you know, tomato plants, for instance, suck certain chemicals out of the soil during their growing processes. And if, uh, if you plant tomatoes in that same place, well, they're going to suck those same substances out of the soil, and the soil is going to become weaker and ultimately depleted. So to prevent that from happening, you just plant tomatoes here, and then next year you plant cucumbers, and the next year you plant corn. You, you, you move the stuff around. Uh, you know, just to, just to tell a story, my grandpa used to have a garden. My dad used to have a garden. I've had gardens before I did it professionally. And at the end of every season, we were very pl pleased and proud to clean all the debris out of the garden and we looked at our beautiful soil all winter long and felt happy that we were ready for next year's garden. And unfortunately, my grandpa was wrong. And unfortunately, my dad was wrong. And unfortunately, in those years, I was wrong also because that was not a good gardening practice. A much better gardening practice would have been is after we cleaned the garden, if we planted some plants. Think about it for a second. When in nature do you ever see naked ground, naked soil? You see naked ground at the beach because it's only sand. It doesn't support anything. But soil, when is it? It's never naked. Nature never allows soil to be idle. Well, when you clean your garden up at the end of the fall, you put in what's called a cover crop. And a cover crop is a mixture of grasses and legumes. Legumes is a particular kind of plant that sticks nitrogen into the soil through its roots. Nitrogen is the fertilizer that plants need. It's a one part of the interaction from plants to organisms to the soil. So, <clears throat> do cover cropping really really important at the end of the season uh, when the cover crop is is uh, uh, when the garden is time to grow the garden next year so when it starts to get warm what you do with the cover crop is you chop it down you chop the cover crop down after the legumes flower because during the flower period is when the legumes put the nitrogen in the soil and you just chop down all the grasses uh, and you rototill everything into the soil. That becomes fertilizer for the soil and enrichment uh, materials for the soil. Uh, one or two more important procedures. One is composting. It's really important to, to, for you to make your own compost because that's a dynamite soil amendment. The plants go crazy when they're in compost, when they're well composted. And you can make the compost yourself. You don't have to go to the garden center and buy it. You just take the leftover plant scraps, for instance, when you're weeding the garden, uh, when you're in the kitchen preparing the vegetables, you don't use every scrap of the vegetable. Sometimes there's plant scraps that are waste. Instead of throwing them in the garbage, garbage throw them in the compost pile. And uh, other kind of plant, plant scraps, the leaves that fall in the autumn, they were alive when they were on the tree, now they're dead. Just they're plant scraps now, so put them in the compost pile. You make make about a through about a four inch layer of plant scraps on on the ground. You could do it right directly on the ground. Just a four inch layer of scrap plant scraps, and on top of that, you <coughs> you you're going to put um, uh, other sub soil building substances like manure or biochar or peat moss 
or something from the sea, kelp, uh, and other, other natural elements. So you're going to put some plant scraps and then you're going to put some soil enriching substances like compost, manure, peat moss, et cetera, et cetera. Put a couple of inches of that on top of your four inches of plant scraps and let it stay for a few weeks and then just mix it up with a, with a fork. Just take it and mix it all together. And uh, over time, that's going to decompose and become a very soft, uh, fluffy, black substance that we call compost. And you want that for your garden. Your plants go crazy with the compost that you add to the garden. And you do it yourself this way with a little uh, uh, effort and you don't have to spend any money. You just get the compost for free, make it yourself. Uh, so, so you need seed selection, multi-cropping, crop rotation, cover cropping, and composting. Those are procedures that you do in a coordinated fashion to make the garden. And we'll go into detail with them as we go along. They're treated in great detail in, in the book. Uh, uh, and there are a couple of other ideas that I wanna plant in your mind at this point. In addition to what you're directly doing to the soil, there are other impacts on the plants growing in your garden. For instance, insects. Some insects are predators to your plants and harm your plants. Uh, cutworms on tomatoes, you know, they just make the whole plant drop dead. Uh, others chew away the leaves. So some insects are predators. Interestingly, there are insects that eat the predators that bother your plants. And you can attract those beneficial insects by what you plant in the garden. I mentioned that you should plant a lot of different kinds of plants. You should implant, plant certain plants that attract beneficial insects to eat the insects that bother your plants. One of the things you could do is you could include flowers in there and, and it's a whole study, but it, I'm trying to show you the interactions that go on to make your garden succeed. Uh, there are companion plants. This is an interesting phenomenon. Uh, when you plant certain plants together, they make each other happy and they thrive. They support the growing of each other just because we, we've got a name for them. We call them companion plants. Uh, interestingly enough, there's the exact opposite. There are plants that if you plant them near each other, they hate each other. And they, neither one of them does well. And there, there's information about companion plants and compa the process of companion planting. And that should be a part of your garden plan. When you're laying out your garden, you've got to consider the sun in relation to where the plants are by size. You've got to, and one thing you could uh, uh, consider are the companion plants, which vegetables like each other and, sh and, and will benefit by being near each other. And, uh, <clears throat> Okay, it's a little bit technical. Uh, you got to read up on it, but so far you haven't spent a penny in the garden center other than for the seeds to get the plants to grow. And you don't have to. This, the line that they give you of commercial fertilizer equals plant food, that's a crock of crap. It will turn the plants green and it will get the plants to grow, but that's not feeding the plant according to its lifestyle, according to the way it was designed to grow. Building the soil in the way that I'm describing to you by adding amendments and by following procedures, 
you give the plants what they need in order to thrive. Some of it costs money, but a, a great deal of it does not cost money. Just put a little effort into it. And after a while, it gets to be a real joy to spend time in the garden doing these things. Uh, one of the underrated benefits of gardening is it's really good for your psychology. Just seeing the little guys pop through the soil and growing and, and developing and making fruit and tending them, uh, holding them up with stakes or this or that. It's a very, very pleasant life experience. We have some life experiences that we're stuck with that are not so pleasant, like traffic, while gardening is a, a very pleasant life experience, in addition to providing you with good, clean, wholesome food. Okay, so now, uh, I'm looking at my outline here to make sure I don't forget anything. I'll, 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 I'll go through it quickly. I've said a lot of it already. Uh, <clears throat> you don't need to use synthetic chemicals on the soil. I, I really, really, in, in the garden, I really, really wish you wouldn't. You wouldn't use a herbicide to kill the weeds and you wouldn't use an insecticide to kill the bugs. There are natural tools that do those jobs way better, way much safer. You don't poison your, your food. You don't poison your animals. You don't poison your children. Don't do that stuff. It's, it's, a, it's a necessary adjunct to industrial style agriculture, which is in itself an aberration against life. And don't get me started. Uh, Oh, there, there are certain substances that are found in nature which will kill undesirable uh, critters in your garden. For instance, uh, there's, there's a chemical was discovered in India from a tree. It's called neem, N-E-E-M. It's a great insecticide. You put this uh, juice from the tree on, on bugs and it kills certain ones. Uh, plain old mineral oil. Uh, mineral oil just smothers the insects. It doesn't, it doesn't have any chemical activity that, that's harmful to the insect or to the plants or to the people who eat the vegetables. Uh, it, it's just a smothering agent. It takes air away and the bugs die. Um, there are some chemicals, gypsum, sulfur, copper. These, these things come in uh, a, a part of a good fertilizing routine and, and they are natural chemicals which help to support plants and protect them from insect and disease damage. In addition, you have other tools in your arsenal to fight against the, ve the, the vegetable plant killers. Uh, there are some critters, some, uh, uh, are you familiar with praying mantis? That's a bug, large bug, like the size of your finger. And it just eats insects, it eats bugs, and it eats bugs that hurt your plants. So if you can get praying mantids into your garden, uh, they're great. Uh, certain spiders are, are ant eaters, insect eaters. Ladybugs, the little round bug with the orange shell and the black dots all over it, ladybugs we call them. Their food so, uh, is, is bugs, insects, they eat bugs. Some people buy ladybugs commercially and spread them around your garden. Uh, I, I don't do that and I don't recommend that. The, the problem with doing that is 
the ladybugs don't always stay in the garden. They decide to fly away and go someplace else. <laughs> so it's not too helpful. Uh, there's a product called, there's a substance called Bacillus thuringiensis, BT. They, they nickname it BT, Bacillus thuringiensis. Great insecticide, non-harmful to the plants, non-harmful to people, doesn't harm anything. It just kills bugs. I told you about mineral oil, the same deal. Neem, the same deal. Mineral oil smothers the bugs. The neem is a poison. The other thing that you can use, and that's quite effective, and you maybe this might be the first thing you try to use if you have a bug problem, is just plain soap. Spray soapy water, very soapy water, on the plants. It doesn't damage the plant in any way, but it does kill bugs. So you might try that simple way, and you don't have to go to the garden center and buy poison and bring it to your house and to your yard and to your family. And I think now is a good time for, for me to show you something that's going to astonish you. This is a film about how plants grow and you, I guarantee you've never seen anything like this because normal people don't look like this kind of stuff. Only crazy people like me and you are interested in this. You, you, you look at what this plant, it tells you the lifestyle of a plant. Okay, so now watch it. I'm going to put it on. Sit back, relax, be happy. For the past few months, plant ecologist J.C. Cahill has been crisscrossing the continent, researching a new book that focuses on one central question. Do plants behave like animals? An idea that seems a little far out to a lot of people. If you talk to just a, a lay person about plant behaviors, you'll just think you're crazy. Um, if you talk to a scientist about plant behavior, they'll think you're crazy and wrong. And you can understand the skepticism. Out in the field, observing plant behavior is a little bit like watching paint dry. Unless, of course, you speed things up. They may not swing from branches or gallop across the savanna, but plants do move and they do behave. And one of the ways they behave is through growth. But does all of this growth really constitute behavior? Are the movements of plants in any way comparable to this? Now, this fox is hunting for mice, using every weapon in his evolutionary arsenal to find a meal. And this plant is doing pretty much the same thing. When an unsuspecting insect roams into a Venus flytrap, all it takes is a brush with two of the plant's trip hairs, and the trap is sprung. The bug is then slowly digested, providing the plant with much needed nutrients. Unless, of course, a lucky victim manages to escape. For years, we just assumed that the flytrap was the exception that proved the rule. Plants don't behave. Turns out, we were wrong. 
what people don't know is that all plants are doing this. All plants are not necessarily eating living organisms, but they're having elaborate behaviors above ground and below ground, but they're slower than the snapping of the fly trap, or they are happening in the soil so we can't see them. But all plants are complex, and all plants have complex feeding behaviors. In fact, every plant on Earth is on a constant hunt for food, including the light they need to photosynthesize. And with the help of time-lapse cameras, we can now enter their world and see how they do it, climbing upward and tracking the sun as it wheels across the sky. But plants don't just need light to thrive. They also need nutrients, food that lies in a hidden world that's just below our feet. As much as 80% of a plant's total mass lives below the ground in a secret world scientists once called the black box. But with the aid of new technology, we're now exploring that world and discovering that when it comes to finding food, plant roots are a lot more animal-like than we ever imagined. Yeah. Not unlike this grizzly family, who are busy foraging for berries and other edible plants. So when an animal moves through the forest and is foraging for berries like a grizzly would, it will find a berry patch and it'll slow down and it'll spend more time there, maybe walking without really going in a far distance. The plants do something roughly similar to that. Back in his lab at the University of Alberta, Cahill has been using this high-tech camera to explore the underground world of foraging plant roots. Some have uh, even nutrients and some have patches of nutrients. Yeah, so we have... These grow boxes have been seeded with nutrient patches, and Cahill and student Pamela Belter have taken thousands of pictures, documenting how long it takes the roots to reach the nutrients, and how they behave once they find them. Closer to the plant itself, about two and three. It takes long hours to review those images, but the surprises are worth the wait. Over here still. Let's go ahead a couple days. Whoa. Oh, yeah. So this is huge growth over three days. This goes, what, two? The sudden root growth three confirms three their suspicions. Three almost three centimeters. Over three days, the growth rate of one root suddenly accelerates as it homes in on a nutrient patch. Then, just as suddenly, growth slows down, while the root, like the grizzlies, eats its fill. Roaming legs or multiplying growth cells. The mechanism may differ, but the foraging behavior is still the same. The question is, how do they do it? How do plants find the food they're looking for, both above the ground and below it, when they have no eyes, no ears, let alone no brain? Well, the feeding habits of this strange snake-like vine may hold the answer. It's called the daughter vine, the Count Dracula of the plant world. The vine has no roots and can't produce its own food, so it lives entirely off a host plant. And it has just 72 hours to find that host, or it dies. Its tiny, teeth-like probes pierce the stem and grow into its victim, draining it of its life-giving sap. And this botanical vampire seems to prefer some plants over others. Tomatoes are among its favorite victims. So how does it find its host? And how does it choose between one plant or another? J.C. Cahill has come to Pennsylvania to meet Consuelo de Mores and Mark Mesher, 
the scientists who solved that mystery. So there's a patch here of uh, our species that grows locally. We brought this okay. plant to the lab, this parasitic plant, Cascuta daughter. We're looking at how these plants interact, but how do they find the host? And we thought for sure somebody had already done that. And then we went back to the literature and there was nothing on that. So what would happen to daughter if it just was really poor in its ability to detect its host? Well, these guys are, are, are obligate parasites, really. So they're completely dependent on the host plant. So a seedling of daughter has to find a host plant within uh, you know, a few days or they'll exhaust their energy resources and die. So really, we expect really uh, intense pressure on these guys to be good at, uh, at, at foraging and identifying their host. But while the daughter vine may be good at finding a victim, could it actually choose between two different host plants? Demoras and Mesher made it their mission to find out. In a series of experiments, they placed wheat and tomato seedlings in the same pot and planted a newly sprouted daughter vine between them. Then they set up a time-lapse camera to see if the seedling was actually making a choice. For hours, it circles the air like a snake, as if sniffing out its victims. And nine times out of ten, its preferred victim is the juicy tomato, a tender plant that's easier to attach to. You really get the sense of a behavior response. So really, there is some fairly strong selection here for this plant to make the right decision, otherwise it will die. How was the little stem making its choice? The team decided to play a hunch. They knew that all plants produce green leaf volatiles, chemical scents released by their leaves as they breathe. So maybe this predatory plant actually was sniffing out its victim. To test that theory, the team devised another experiment. First, they captured the scent of a tomato, essentially condensing the chemical odor released by the plant. Once it's distilled, they present the tomato perfume to the vine. Along with a real tomato, it can't possibly smell. Time after time, the daughter homes in on the chemical language that says, yes, I'm a tomato. There's no doubt with the daughter, there's choice. There's choice involving the, uh, a suitable host or non-suitable host. This is a very familiar thing in animal foraging behavior that we're seeing in this plant foraging behavior. But the daughter isn't the only plant that's exhibiting animal-like behavior. Once it's under full-scale daughter attack, the tomato releases the chemical equivalent of a scream. In fact, many plants emit a chemical SOS when they're under attack. And we've all caught a whiff of it. It's the smell of freshly cut grass. We all love the smell of freshly cut grass. We all love the smell of flowers that we put into a vase. We all love the smells of plants. But those smells mean one thing to us than they mean to the other individuals in that environment. And we are causing stress. We are causing trauma to these plants. It's the plant's way of calling out for help. So if it's a cry for help, who or what are plants calling out to? Well, if this unassuming desert plant is any indication, they may be calling in some pretty effective reinforcements. Insects that eat the insects that eat them. The 
desert isn't the most welcoming place for people, but it can be an ecological nightmare for some plants. Unlike us, plants can't escape the heat or walk for miles to find water, nor can they run and hide when they're attacked by insects. But it's precisely because they can't move that plants have evolved some pretty nifty methods of self-defense. We used to think or used to view plants sort of as just sitting there, whatever happens, happens. They make their seeds and, and they go on. But we're realizing it's much more complex. They're actively engaging with the environment in which they live. They actively communicate. They actively respond to the nutrients and the predators and the herbivores that are around them. It's a really dynamic system. So when you take a look at a plant and if you were to rip off a leaf, and then think about this from the plant's point of view. What just happened was something came around and ate some of its body. And so this plant that was just damaged by me ripping it off is likely to start changing its defensive chemistry. It can start uh, uh, communicating with its neighbors or insects and all those processes begin. Here in the Utah desert, there's a wild species that's showing us just how dynamic plants are when it comes to self-defense. It's called Nicotiana attenuata, the wild tobacco plant. For more than a decade, Ian Baldwin has been studying the wild tobacco and the amazing ways it responds to threats in its environment. This plant's genome has probably an order of magnitude more genes involved in environmental perception than most animals do. Most plants have to because they sit still and they have to really tune their physiology and biochemistry to what's going on. And they need a very sophisticated system of perception and response. And being able to respond quickly is essential for wild tobacco because its seeds need wildfire to kickstart their growth. And they can wait for hundreds of years for that to happen. So when they finally do emerge, they may face enemies they've never seen before. It has no idea what it's gonna face when it germinates out of that seed bank and has to cope with whatever's there. There are all these other organisms that rain in on this habitat that's just been cleared out by a fire. Just about every part of the plant is attacked in a different way by a specialist that, that feeds on that particular part. It's a very complex problem they've got to solve. And it's not just one problem. This plant's enemies are as plentiful as desert sunlight. But it turns out that the wild tobacco has a secret chemical weapon to deploy. an herbivore attacks, it ramps up a toxin, one that some of us are all too familiar with. It's evolved a toxin that will poison any organism that has a muscle. And that is this, this molecule called nicotine, the one that human beings have such a relationship with. So anything that moves um, and wants to eat this plant is going to be poisoned by this thing. But while its nicotine cocktail poisons some bugs, it has absolutely no impact on this one. In fact, the hornworm caterpillar can mow down a tobacco plant in a matter of days. But this cunning little plant has a few more defensive tricks up its leaves. Once the caterpillar starts feeding, the plant's leaves release an SOS, chemical messages that drift up into the air where they're picked up by the enemies of their enemies. Predators that just love feasting on caterpillars. You've seen several geocers in this area, right? And if you find it hard to believe that plants can call in insect mercenaries, Baldwin has proof. In one experiment, he captured the chemical signals released by the leaves of plants that were under attack. Then, he glued caterpillar eggs onto a leaf, smeared them with the chemical scent, 
and waited to see if anyone would show up. Within a matter of hours, this insect has responded to the plant's call for help. It's called the big-eyed bug, a pint-sized predator that devours eggs and larvae alike. In fact, it's even been known to take a bite out of a full-sized caterpillar. even know who's attacking it, let alone which predator to call in? Well, the answer lies in yet another chemical message. This one delivered by the caterpillar itself. When the caterpillar chews in a plant, it has to have saliva in its mouth. And the, in that saliva, there are these various compounds that provide information to the, to the plant. And the plant uses those compounds to say, ah, it is the hawk moth and not a, a negro bug that's feeding on me. And so it adjusts and tunes its responses to that particular herbivore. And Baldwin has discovered that this plant has another secret weapon, specifically designed to rid itself of caterpillars. This is a trichome, a sweet little treat deposited by the plant and irresistible to caterpillars. Beautiful, yes, but it's as lethal as a landmine. When this little guy chows down on a trichome, it gets a very bad case of body odor. 20 minutes after eating the trichome, they're smelling. So what we've learned from these particular smells is that they inform predators, particularly ground foraging predators. The plant is offering this nice little sugary first meal for the caterpillars, but it's an evil lollipop because the caterpillar gets tagged for predation. It's the razor blade in the apple yeah, at Halloween time. Plants, after all, can't run away, so they have to do this. They have to be able to solve their environmental problems by changing the organism that they are. And being able to change who they are is critical to the tobacco plant's survival. Because it turns out that the mother of these voracious caterpillars is also the plant's best friend. Its main pollinator, the hawk moth. in through the irresistible draw of light. Wild tobacco flowers bloom at dusk, the perfect draw for a nocturnal pollinator like the hawk moth. As the moth sips nectar, it gathers pollen, spreading it from one plant to the next. But while the moth happily does the plant's sexual bidding, it has its own reproductive agenda. A single moth can lay as many as 200 eggs, eggs that grow into plant-munching caterpillars. So sometimes, despite its best defenses, the wild tobacco can still get infested with caterpillars. Even then, the plant has another card to play. It simply switches pollinators. Baldwin's colleague, Danny Kessler, was the first to observe this astonishing behavior. He was out photographing tobacco plants in the early hours before dawn. Most were infested with caterpillars. As he worked, he began to notice something unusual. Instead of blooming at night, some of the flowers were opening at dawn and the daytime flowers didn't look or smell the way they should. They differed completely from the, from the night opening flowers in, in terms of nectar volume, sugar concentration. And what, what we found out later, even they didn't um, 
um, emit floral volatiles as well. When we walked around and we saw that almost any plant had caterpillars on them, it was really a huge outbreak. And we felt, hmm, what's going on here? It's, it's kind of, it was weird, right? And the weirdness continued. Not only had the bloom's nectar and perfume changed, the shape of the flower itself had completely transformed. Essentially, by changing its flowers and bloom time, the plant had stopped talking to its nocturnal pollinator, the hawk moth, and struck up a conversation with the daytime pollinator, the hummingbird. Well, uh, if there's anybody out there who's not absolutely astonished, I'm very surprised and disappointed. I had no idea of these plant life support activities until I got into this to the extent that I am. And I just can't resist sharing it with you because I hope that you have been astonished at what you see. And you begin to understand why you don't have to use the poisons to kill off bugs. There are other tools that we have. Unfortunately, they're not so well publicized because nobody can make any money out of a lot of the natural cures. So, uh, so keep in mind, um, build strong soil, which will feed the plant the nutrients it needs, and then let the plant do its thing. Let it live its existence, and it, it, will, it will be um, survivable just by, just by its very nature. It's, all living things have a, a survival nature. We all, we all want to, to continue to live and to reproduce. And that's exactly what happens with plants. And they don't need us to come around with chemicals to kill the bugs. Plant has its own way to take care of it. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> we, uh, we spoke a little bit about uh, compost. Um, I mentioned you know, the formula, get your kit, your, your plant scraps, your kitchen waste, your garden trimmings, the, the leaves. Uh, you could use co coffee grinds, you could use pulverized eggshells. Uh, all all are, are good ingredients to make a nice compost pile. And they all come from stuff that, that we, we waste. We, we, we consider waste, we throw it in the garbage. So instead of doing that, use it in the compost pile. Some things you should not include when you make a compost pile, and this is important. Uh, sometimes your plants get diseased. They, the leaves uh, turn yellow and, and they get spots on them and stuff. Don't put diseased leaves in the compost because the disease organisms generally will survive the heat of the compost pile and all you'll be doing is you'll be planting that disease in next year's garden. So disease plant parts go in the garbage. Uh, meats, dairy, cooked foods, none of that stuff goes in the compost. You put the meats in and, and you, you bring the predators, you know, you get the, the, the rats and you get the raccoons and you get a, that stuff doesn't go in the compost. Uh, you got to be careful. No dog manure, no cat manure, no pig manure, no human manure. You, you don't put those kinds of manures in, in the compost pile. The, the hooved animal manures are great. Uh, 
there are, I, I mentioned when you weed the garden, the weeds are, are great for the compost pile, but you have to be careful because uh, most, most weeds, uh, when you rip them out of the ground, you find a root pattern. It, it looks like a long, long hair, if you'll indulge me. Uh, I, I'll call those ordinary weeds. Throw them in the compost pile, they're perfect. But when you pull some weeds, you're going to find the roots look different. They, they only have three or four or five horizontal spreading roots, usually whitish. There's no big bushy uh, like, like long hair. It's just three or four stringy things that go out horizontal. That's the way these, we, these weeds reproduce. That's these horizontal growths go out. Uh, up will pump uh, uh, a sprig, a little seedling, and, and the weed will now be three weeds. And, and so forth, those, those horizontal growing roots. That's how this, these particular kind of plants that we call weeds reproduce and grow and survive. If you get, when you get weeds that have that weird root pattern, throw them away. Don't put them in your compost pile because they also will be planted in next year's garden. So you'll be planting weeds in your garden for next year. When you, ha when you have those horizontal grow growing root systems, that's a perennial plant. It, most weeds are annual plants. They live for one, one season and they die. These plants don't die. These, these creepy crawler type plants they live on and, and you put them in your compost pile and they'll reproduce next year and you'll have more weeds than you had before. So just throw those kind of weed plant type plants, perennial weeds, throw them in the garbage. Uh, also, don't put commercially grown cut flowers in your compost. I mean, you get these beautiful bouquets and they give a lot of pleasure in a lot of ways and and I'm, I'm all in favor of that. I'm, I'm a great flower guy. But uh, most of them are grown down in Colombia. They're inundated with all kinds of chemicals to, to get maximum productivity and maximum growth performance and everything else. Just when you finish with the beautiful bouquet of flowers, put it in the garbage and let it rest in peace. Don't put it in your compost pile. Uh, So you got your plant scraps, uh, garden trimming, screen leaves, coffee bags, pulverized eggshells, etc. Through that four inch lay, and as I said before, a couple of inches of uh, manure or compost or biochar or brown leaves, some, some substances like those which are complementary to the garden waste that you put in. The garden wastes need these other manure compost autumn leaves to create the, the compost. So you have to mix these two things together. Four inches of the plant scraps, two inches of the, the manure and stuff, peat moss. And then you, you stir them up after, a, let them sit for a few weeks, then you stir them up and you do it again. Then you put another four inch layer of plant scraps and another two inches of um, manure or peat moss or something of that nature. And, and you stir it up again. And you keep doing that until what will happen is over time, a decomposition process will occur. The, the bacteria, they're, they're called aerobic bacteria, bacteria that live in air. They will decompose 
these plant scraps and peat moss and other things that you put into your leaves, into your pile, they will decompose them and change them into this black dirt, sort of dirtish, you know, powdery substance that we call compost and that, that the plants go crazy for it. So <clears throat> you mix it um, and how do you use it? Well, uh, what's that? Okay, so it looks like we're getting some questions. So um, Martha was asking what exactly is biochar? Okay. Biochar is a substance that was discovered recently in South America. Uh, in, uh, in the rainforest down there, as people are doing whatever they're doing, just living or, or studying, experimenting, they found these pits of black, black dirt. The whole rest of the terrain is sort of a grayish, but this is pit of blackness. And they want to find out what is this substance and, and what's it doing here? How did it get here? And what's its purpose? Well, after, after extensive research, what they figured out was this seems to be a, a garbage disposal system for prehistoric humans. People who lived here would take their waste and throw it into a hole. And again and again and again, and the hole will fill up and it would decompose over the centuries into this black stuff. They didn't even know what it was. So what they ended up naming it was biochar. They called it biochar. This is biochar. Okay. And then, it's charcoal made from eons of, of waste material that decomposed. What they found out about it is it is dynamite plant food. It's the best of all plant foods. The plants go crazy when you plant them in biochar. So I suggest that you use biochar as one of the soil amendments in your, in your ordinary ground and also in your compost pile to mix in together with everything. So that's what compost is. It's a, a, it, 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 it was about, about uh, 2000. It was first discovered and it took about 10 years for people to figure out what it was and, and so forth. And then another five years or so for it to be commercialized to get into the, the business stream, the commercial stream with patents and manufacturing and, and advertising and so forth. So now you can buy biochar in garden centers. It, you could buy it through the internet if the garden centers don't have it. It's quite not unusual and not rare anymore. I don't want to say it's common because it's not as common as peat moss or something like that, but it's quite common and it is a spectacular soil amendment, and that's why it's on my list of things that you should uh, uh, use. Okay, and um, Lori is a little confused about what manure you should use. So like chicken, llama, goat. Um, she's also asking about wood ash from fire for the compost pile. How much would you use? Okay. Uh, what was the first part? Um, what kind of like animal manure would you Any use? hoofed animal, sheep, cows, uh, horses. Uh, no, not horses. Wait, I'll get the horses. So, uh, those are very commonly available, particularly here in such a rural area, farm country. That kind of manure is, is easy to get. And if you actually go to the farmer, most of the time, just give it to you, he's glad to get rid of it. The thing you have to be careful of when you use manure is you cannot put green manure, fresh manure in the garden. 
that's the stuff that makes you sick. That's, that's how you get sick from vegetables where the fruit touches green manure, fresh manure. You've got to use old manure, dried manure. And it's simple. You know, if you're talking to a farmer, I mean, he'll tell you, you know, go down to the right-hand side. That's where we put the manure from two years ago. And then we built, we put more here and more here and more here. So the, the manure on the left-hand side, that's the new manure. So just talk to him. He'll tell you, where's the old manure? That, that's why, and he knows what you want it for. So uh, um, th those, those kind of manures, pig manure is great. Chicken manure is even greater. Um, the, the, the thing with the manure, and I'll get into this a, a little bit more later on, uh, the thing with the manure is you cannot let the fruit, the vegetable that you're growing, tomato or cucumber, you can't let that touch the manure. If the vegetable touches the manure, that's how you get sick. That's the salmonella, that's the E. coli, that's all these diseases that come from, from gardens. So you have to be careful of that. And the way, the way I do it, might as well lay it out right now. Uh, <laughs> when I put my soil amendments in the fall, compost, peat moss, biochar, uh, everything that I, that I throw down, something from the sea. You always use kelp or something, something from the sea as a soil amendment. I put them on the top of the ground. I don't rototill them in. I put them at the top of the ground, and then I throw my cover crop down, right on top, right on top of all of that stuff. And the cover crop seeds germinate, and the cover crop grows all winter long. So you use winter hardy plants. Uh, the cover crop grows all winter long. And then in the spring, I cut the cover crop down, and that's the time that I rototill the cover crop and all the soil amendments that I put down in the fall, particularly the manure I'm concerned with. I rototill all of that stuff in. So the manure has been on the top of the ground being weather beaten uh, October, November, December, January, February, March, at least six months. And it's lost its potency from the sunshine and the weather. And by rototilling that in, in the springtime, you have a perfectly, perfectly safe um, uh, soil amendment and, and ground to put your plants in. But be careful because you can't use the green manure. That's when, when people have trouble. It's, it's because they use manure that's fresh. Okay. So, did that answer the question? Well, there was another part to that question. Yes. Well, I want to back up a little bit because Shannon was saying that her parents talked about the importance of brown matter and green matter in compost and that there was an important balance to maintain in order to create the heat that would make the compost. So I'm assuming brown matter and green matter is your manure, but you're saying not to use green manure at all. So yeah, that's there. exactly what I'm saying. Be careful because you're using the color names here and they have different meanings. Okay. Same words, but different meanings. <clears throat> I mentioned to you, you use plant scraps from your kitchen and then you take some uh, garden leaves and, and uh, weeds and, and uh, uh, other debris and, and you mix them together. I call the substances by their names. A lot of people in the gardening industry call them by the color. They call green matter, make a compost pile out of green matter. They're talking plant scraps. They, all the plant scraps that go into a compost pile, most of them are green. So people call it green matter. And if you think about the, the, peat moss and the compost and the other amendments, they're usually brown. The dried leaves that come down from the trees, they're usually brown. So people call that brown matter in the compost. So you make a compost pile, two parts of green matter, 
one part of brown matter. And that's what they're talking about. The relationship is twice as much green matter as brown matter. I mentioned to you, make a pile four inches deep of plant scraps and make another pile two inches deep of manure and, compo uh, and, and compost and peat moss and other things. So I'm saying the same thing using different words than they're saying. And the words that they're using, brown matter and green matter, are sort of nicknames. But that's, that's basically what, what that means. Uh, they're saying the same thing I'm saying. They're just using different words to describe it. Okay. And then um, going and, back. And they said that the relationship is important, a certain proportion. That's right. Twice as much green matter as uh, brown matter. That's why I said four inches and two inches. Okay. Um, and then going back to what Lori was saying, she was asking about the wood ash from fire for a compost. She said, how much of that would you use? <clears throat> I wouldn't use any wood ash in the compost. Uh, I would use wood ash on the soil, the soil on top of the ground, when I'm trying to reduce the acidity of the soil. The, the burned wood ashes, as long as it's burned from clean wood, not painted wood or rotten wood, clean wood ashes spread on top of the ground neutralizes acid in the soil. It's a great free way to use acid instead of going to the store and buying lime, which is the, uh, the conventional way of reducing the acid in the soil. The only problem with that is you have to be careful because the, uh, the, the, the wood ash has, has a tendency to uh, add uh, too much of another substance. I can't remember the name of it right now. Excessive wood ash, although it's a good thing to put it down as a soil sweetener and neutralize acid, if you use too much of it, it has a, a harmful effect. So you just have to be careful when you use the wood ash. Don't put too much of it down. And then um, Anne asked... But um, I don't use it in the compost pile. I never put wood ash in the compost pile. Okay. Oh, sorry. That's okay. Uh, um, so Anne said, um, she's asking, so you said don't use horse manure, but she's asking if you can use composted horse manure. Yeah, the pro why I said don't use horse manure, and I stick to that, because horse manure is full of weeds. Weed seeds. Weed seeds. If it's composted, if it's, uh, uh, I mean, if it's green horse manure or if it's aged horse manure, it's still full of weed seeds. So you put horse manure in your garden and you're planting weeds. And that's why I say don't use horse manure. There are so many other manures you can use. I never go near horse manure for that reason. Okay. Uh, we're going to do a couple more questions and then we're going to let you. <laughs> finished, but um, do you have a preferred cover crop? Yeah, yeah, cover crop should be a mixture of grasses and legumes. Legumes are, are the, the, the lentil family, peas, uh, uh, peas, lentils. Uh, they have a, a growing habit where the roots go down into the ground and the roots deposit nitrogen in the ground. Beans, peas, uh, that's the only plant that does that. They're called legumes. That's a family of plants that will actually fertilize the ground when you plant them. That's why you want them in your cover crop. It's f you're fertilizing the ground while you're covering it up. Uh, secondly, is in the cover crop, the grasses. Uh, the grasses don't fertilize the ground at all, but what the grasses do is you cut them down and they, and then you grind them into the soil and they become food for the organisms that are living in the soil. Those organisms attack and decompose the grass, the grasses. So you're feeding the, the microorganisms with the grasses and you're providing nitrogen, you're fertilizing the soil with the legumes. 
So a cover crop has a combination, uh, legumes, peens, bees, that kind of thing, plus grasses. And they're very common uh, to get everybody, I mean, commercial garden centers, they, they have cover crop mixes where they mix grasses and legumes and you could buy a mixture. Um, you could do it through the mail. All the mail order houses sell cover crops of different mixtures. And, uh, and, and that's what that's all about. Okay. And um, the last one that we'll do is, um, Anna's asking, uh, she says, I have a garden site that has been neglected, but I'm going to start using it this spring. What do I do if I don't have ground cover from the winter? Um, she says it has some tall weeds in it and otherwise bare ground, but how do I get it ready? <clears throat> what I would suggest you do is you start with a soil test. You need to know the chemical composition of that soil. Sometimes strange soil, soil you've never seen before, ha has too much acid. It's too acidic. And plants have a certain percentage of acid where they thrive. But more than that, the plants won't grow right. And the same thing with the opposite. If the plants have not enough acid, if they have too much base, what they call basic, that's the pH. If they have too much basic pH, the same thing. They won't grow with too much. So the acidity of the soil is measured on a scale from one to 14. And neutral, number seven, is exactly a even balance, acidity and, and uh, basic. Most vegetable plants like a little bit of acidity. So somewhere between six and seven is more or less the ideal acid range for plants. You go below six and it gets too acid, you go above seven and it gets too basic. The plants don't thrive in that kind of environment. Uh, so, so that's the, the stuff about acidity. But there's more to soil condition than just the acidity. That's one part. That's how you start. That's the, the laboratory part. You can never find out without a, a chemical analysis the, the acidity and or the basic. And once you know that, then you know what you have to do to do a remedy. If you have too much acid, you put down lime or small amount of wood chips. If you have too much basic, you put down sulfur and that neutralizes that. So the, the soil test gives you your guidance as to what treatment you have to give to the soil. And then you add your other amendments, uh, compost, peat, moss, cow manure, something from the ocean, kelp, uh, you add all of that stuff, just throw it on top, and then mix it all in. And all of those substances contribute to a healthy soil, a soil which supports the microscopic critters, which are the most important ones in the soil, even though you can't see them. They thrive on all of those amendments that I'm suggesting you use. That's how you build a uh, uh, plant, a strong plant supporting soil. Um, she said she didn't, she didn't know what? Didn't know how much? No, she was just asking how she gets it ready. What's that? She was just asking how she gets it ready. Oh yeah, okay, so I, I just told you, you test, the chem you test the chemistry, then you add your soil amendments. Um, this, if you do the amendments that I suggested, they, uh, they break down soil if it has too much clay, they thicken up soil that has too much sand. The soil has to be a combination sand, silt, clay, and the other things that I mentioned at the start of the show. So, uh, <clears throat> 
Soil test first, all the amendments, including something from the sea, second, and then uh, you've got you've to start. And, and you plant your vegetables, you get a reaction, and then you monitor it in the fall, more same soil amendments, and then in the uh, springtime, another soil test, and, and you're on your way. You have to monitor it, and you have to pay attention to these few things that I'm describing to you. Uh, okay, so we made compost. Remember we talked about compost, four inches, two inches. Uh, how do you use it? Now you got compost, what do you do with it? Well, one thing you do with it is you throw it on the ground as a soil amendment. In the springtime, get your compost and spread it around and rototill it in. Another thing you do is during the season when your plants are growing, you can take compost, finished compost, and put it on the top of the ground at the base of the plants. It's called a top dressing. The, the nutrient value in the compost will percolate down into the soil and get to the soil roots just by the action of the rain and, and the weather. So that's another thing you do with compost. And a third thing you'll do is you can make something called compost tea. I'm going to give you a detailed lesson on compost tea in the future about how to make it and what to do with it. And it is great. It is a great garden fertilizer and it's free. It's just compost that you made in your yard uh, mixed with water, but you have to do it right. And it's a spectacular fertilizer. So what do you have to go to the store and buy bags of fertilizer? You make it yourself, it's free. Okay, so the idea is to get the soil to be nutritious, to use a word, to, uh, to support plants by making a comfortable home for living creatures, worms and bugs and, and insects and microorganisms. You, you want them to, that's their home. You want to make them comfortable. You want to make a home for them. When they are alive in that soil, they interact with the plants through the plant's roots and they give nourishment to the plants. So it's the critters in the soil that feed your plants. It's not the stuff from the garden center that you throw on top of the ground and the plant turns green and gets big. That's not the, 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 the same as the plants the plant being fed by nature's way from the soil critters feed, feeding through the roots and so forth. Uh, there's a lot, in the, a lot in the paper, in the news and everything about uh, living soil, soil filled with living critters taking carbon out of the atmosphere and storing it. And that's true, but it, it works through an intermediary. <laughs> the intermediary is the plants. The plants get sunshine and do photosynthesis, which is how they grow. And in the, a part of the process is through the, the bottom of the leaves, they have these uh, uh, tiny little, tiny little uh, holes that they suck in uh, nitrogen and carbon from the air. And, and feed it down into the plant. So uh, that's, that's what uh, another thing that, that living soil supports plants so plants can take carbon out of the atmosphere. Um, yeah, it holds water. Uh, you know, the, the, the sand at the beach, you put water on it and it goes away. The soil doesn't hold the water. And you get a clay, uh, real heavy clay. So you put water on it and it just stays there. The, the water doesn't percolate through the clay because the clay particles are so tiny and they stick together so close that the water can't get through it, can't wiggle its way down. So 
a good soil that you create in the way I've described will hold water, will allow water to percolate down to find to the, to the roots of the plants. So it will give the plants the water they need. Uh, it, it also will hold water, it minimizes runoff. You have, you have heavy rain. A lot of times the soil absorbs as much of the rain as it can, and then it just runs off the top of the ground, goes downhill or, or wherever. And uh, uh, you minimize that. You, you also generally minimize flooding because a lot of, a lot of soil, uh, the soil holds a great deal of the water. Uh, so I would say uh, soil building is the most important part of, of growing vegetables because the soil is key to the life of the vegetables. If you get good open pollinated vegetables that will give you seeds that you can save and plant next year, those plants will thrive like anything and they will develop a strong resistance to disease and to insect attacks. It's almost like people. Some people seem to be quite robust and they don't break down very often. They don't seem to get sick so much and they're not sickly. They're just tough. The same thing is true of plants. If plants get what they need, that I've been knocking myself out all evening talking to you about what they need. If the plants get what they need, they grow strong. They get robust, they become tough, and they thrive and give good fruit, and they resist attacks from insects and resist attacks from diseases better because they're stronger and healthier. They're not weaklings like we get. Some people are not, not powerful. They're sort of frail. And the same thing with plants. And I'm telling you how to make the plants Hardy, tough, strong. <clears throat> yeah, the whole deal is making the soil. I've got my notes here that I'm looking at to make sure I don't forget anything, but it boils down to what I, what I mentioned to you. Uh, in the time that's left, I want to talk with you a little bit about industrial agriculture the way we get our food now. It started way back. Uh, we, had the, we had what's called the Industrial Revolution. Before you used to have, uh, say, a guy makes a rifle. He was a craftsman. He was in his workshop. He was making the barrel, and he was making the stock, and he was making the parts, and he was putting them together, and he made a rifle. He's a rifle maker. That's his job. Uh, it's his livelihood. Uh, and, and everything else, you know, the shoes for the horses and uh, the bits that they put in their mouths. Well, you got the blacksmith, he does that, he, he makes that. And, and so on and so forth. Everybody had what we call a trade. Everybody had a trade, he had a craft, he made it, and, and uh, that's how he, he survived economically. And then that changed. Some of these people came along and says, you know, why don't we bring these different craftsmen together in one building and have them all work close together and they could support each other and be more efficient and more productive. And somebody invented factories. And then they invented industrial processes in the factories. You had these efficiency experts with the with the stopwatch. How long does it take the man to move from here to there? Well, if we move the container a little bit closer, he'll take like, he could produce more. And they invented industrial production, industrial processes. And it all worked great in factories. Uh, think about this. You're in a factory, you make wrenches. Okay, so your factory makes a wrench. You, you put the parts together, the wrenches go out the door, they get sold to a user, and the user 
dies or gets tired of wrenching and he passes the wrench on to his son or to his neighbor or to some guy who buys it from him. And that guy uses the wrench and then uh, the wrench somehow finds its way to another guy and it's used as a wrench by a third person or removed from the purchaser, the original purchaser. But it's always a wrench. It always stays wrench. When you apply that industrial process to living things, it falls apart. It does not work. Why doesn't it work? If you think a minute, you know why it doesn't work. It doesn't work because every generation is different than the generation before it. Your children are not identical to you and your wife, or your wife and your husband, or whoever, the father and mother. There are slight differences, the color of the eyes, the complexion, who knows what. Industrial processes cannot accommodate changes. Industrial processes require continuity and human beings and plants don't continue identically generation after generation. That's why the whole idea of applying industrial processes, one planting over a hundred acres, we're going to plant wheat, a hundred acres of wheat. Nature never, ever, ever does that. But the industrialists do it because it's mathematical, it's systematic, it's efficient. The same thing with uh, number of, of different plants. Uh, of, <clears throat> yeah. Industrialization requires similarity and uniformity and, and uh, sequence processes. All of those things are not applicable to living creatures. No living creature is totally systematic, totally mathematical, totally predictable, totally organizable. We're alive, we're dynamic. We change, we reproduce. If, if my generation has some kind of a problem, the children that I produce, they tend to not have the same susceptibility to the same problem. And if it goes a second generation or a third generation, the problem that I used to have, they don't have anymore because their organism has adapted to that unwholesome situation and they survived it. They got different genes or they got different antibodies or they got something different that protects them from the thing that used to attack me three generations ago. That doesn't happen with a wrench. A wrench never changes. So whoever got the brilliant idea to make wrenches in a factory was genius. But whoever thought that was a good way to grow plants was an idiot. Because human, living creatures don't work that way. It's a process that does not apply to living creatures. And we're stuck with it because we all live in industrial agriculture in these civilized societies. 100 acres of wheat, 100 acres of corn. How are you going to handle it? Gigantic machinery, uh, unbelievable production. Uh, uh, <laughs> Because all the plants are the same, they attract the bugs. The bugs come and wipe out the whole field. Well, we can't let that happen. The, the, the corn-loving bugs eat all the corn. We can't let that happen. So we'll put down poison and kill the corn-eating bugs. Okay, you did. You survived your corn. But now your corn is poisoned. The people who eat the corn are now eating the poison. What the hell's going on here? It's a... Uh, it's, uh, Industrial agriculture is a bad 
system. The system is the, 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 the wholesome system, the valid system is small scale local agriculture. And I just had, uh, today I ate a, a mango. The freaking mango was grown in Peru. I gotta have a mango that grew in Peru. That's industrial agriculture. That's what made it possible. I'm spoiled. I could eat a mango in, in March, be in the middle of my, but <laughs> don't, don't you see as clearly as I do that it, it, it's unnatural and it's unwholesome. And I say it's making people sick. And I'll, I'll get back to this. When I was a kid, children, they had what's called children's disease. Measles, chicken pox, whooping cough, and uh, chicken pox, whooping cough. one other one. There was four childhood diseases. And you get sick, you get this disease, you go to the doctor, he gives you some medicine. Two weeks later, the, the, the illness is gone and you're cured and you never get it again because the, the antibodies in your organism protect you. When I look at the kids now, I don't see that. I see coming out of the womb, kids on uh, a spectrum uh, what do they call that when the kids have that, or not autism? Is it autism? I think it's autism. And they come, they come out of the womb ill, and they, it stays with them forever and ever. They're always autistic. They're on the autistic spectrum to stronger disease or less strong disease but they're still ill and they're always ill. I never saw so many kids that have ear infections. Never in my life did I hear about ear infections the way I do now. Every kid ear infected. Uh, okay. Well. All kinds of illnesses <laughs> that, that okay. we should be healthy human beings, but I, I think we're being poisoned. Something is wrong somewhere. And I think the problem is with industrial agriculture. I think we're being fed stuff that's hurting us. And also, just take a look at how fat we're going. Uh. Okay, so sorry to cut you short, but um, okay. we want to keep this. I got on my, <laughs> yeah. my we want to keep this um, hopefully to a two-hour mark. So we got like fifteen minutes before we hit our two-hour mark, and I want to open it up so if people want to ask you some questions, that's fine. You can answer I, some I, I'd questions. love to. I'll do my best to okay. help anybody who. Perfect. Wants. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to write them in the chat box, and I will read them out to Vince, and um, he will do his best to answer them. Um, so we have one um, that John said that is um, if you are planting raised beds, can you buy certain kinds of worms to add to it? Are there any other necessities for raised beds? Uh, yes, you can buy worms that are good for agriculture. Uh, <laughs> there are a lot of uh, substances and organisms uh, that are necessary for a really healthy soil, as I said twice or three times already. Some of them you can buy. Most of them you can't buy. Um, this aspect of soil building, whether it's in a raised bed or in a bed uh, on at ground level, doesn't change. The nature of the process is the same. So what you can do on, on a garden that's built on the ground, you can do in a garden that's built in a raised bed and vice versa. The nature of the plants doesn't change and the nature of what the plants need doesn't change. So the same soil amendments that you put in the ground, you put in the, in the raised bed. The thing you're going to find with worms and 
and I found, found this. Okay, well, well, let's take more questions. If we have time left over, I'll tell you something about worms. You can go. Yeah, okay. So in my garden, uh, I had this garden for 13 years, and every spring and every fall, I loaded up amendments that I described 100 times. I used to buy 10-yard truckloads of compost and, and put it down, and pallets of peat moss and put it in my mouth. After 13 years, to get into my garden, you had to step up because I built so much more soil than was there to begin with. When you walked in my garden, you felt like you were walking on marshmallows. The soil was so delicate and so soft and everything grew like, you saw the pictures, everything grew like crazy. And I didn't put any chemicals. I didn't go to no garden center. I didn't do any of that crap. Okay, so uh, you, can, you can succeed at gardening by doing the right practices. And the thing about worms that's fantastic, I went out to my garden one day and I see all kinds of stuff on top of my ground, like dirt, all kinds of dirt on top of my crown and my garden was saying what the hell and then I says wait a minute that's not dirt those are worm castings that's the excretions from the worms and I had so many worms in that soil that they were making so many worm castings that I didn't have to fertilize the ground anymore it was being fertilized by the residents and that's the kind of thing that's, uh, I, it never was my intention. I never expected it to happen, but it's absolutely ideal. What could be better? It's, it's natural, it's free, it's totally effective. It's the way ground is supposed to, you know, fertile ground is supposed to be, and it made plants like, like crazy. Okay. Um, John would like to know, can you make biochar? No, I don't think you can, John. I think, I think biochar is a substance which occurs over extremely long periods of time. Uh, uh, and, I, and I would go by millennia, decades and decades, maybe even millennia. Uh, to get biochar, to the best of my knowledge, you have to buy it. Can't get it any other way. It's not like something from the sea. You can get substances from the sea, which the garden benefits by tremendously, uh, just, just by going, I mean, uh, the, traditionally the Indians used to go to the shore and, and pick up the eelgrass, which is seaweed, and throw it in the gardens. And people still do that to this day. People go down to the, to the shore and take the, take the long spaghetti type seaweed looks like fettuccine <laughs> but uh that's called eelgrass and it's a wonderful soil amendment and you can do that you can get it and it's free but you can't do that kind of thing with biochar okay um sean is asking um when you are talking about the four inch to two inch for compost um are you doing this on your garden or in a separate area just for compost in a separate area just for compost it's called a compost pile or a compost container sometimes people build an actual container sometimes people put a fence around uh, there are all different ways sometimes people do nothing they just throw it on the ground and uh, you put your layers the way I described you mix up the layers and in time decomposition will occur so you take the stuff that's like partially decomposed and you move it over a little bit to the next compartment and you start fresh two inches four inches two inches four inches and you mix it up and when it's partially done you put it over there and then over a period of time it it decomposes itself and at the end you have pure black lovely compost Okay, um, Patricia is wondering, can you add pine needles into your compost? Yes, you can, but not be careful because pine needles are very acidic. 
but you can put pine needles in, but not too much. Okay. Um, Sandra says that her bok choy was infected by caterpillars. And she's wondering if you think the soap will work to kill them for the future. I would definitely try that as my first attack on those uh, critters. The first thing I would do is soap the plants. Um, Anna is wondering if you're going to teach um, how to make trellises in a future class. <clears throat> how about if I teach how to make trellises right now? <laughs> <laughs> it's the simplest thing in the world because all I did was go to a vineyard and I looked at how the, the wine growers held their vines up and they held them up by putting poles in the ground here and there and then stringing wire all along the poles. So that's exactly what I did. I went to my garden, I put poles in the ground and I strung wires. I strung to make a six foot high trellis. I started with an eight foot pole, stuck two feet in the ground. Now I had six foot left. And then I would put four wires across the whole thing horizontally. And that's my, that's my trellis. Okay. It's a lot of work and it's expensive because uh, to buy the steel, you gotta get the right kind of steel. Just copy what the vineyards do. You ask the guy, what kind of steel do you use? Where do you get the poles? I got them from the vineyard supplier. I got the wire from the vineyard supplier. And I had it for 13 years. When I left, it was the same as when I put it in the first day. It was just, it just eternal once you do it. Okay. Kristen is wondering, would you personally recommend alfalfa as a crop, uh, cover crop in our area? I would love alfalfa. Alfalfa is one of my favorite cover crop materials because alfalfa is the only legume grass that I know. Alfalfa plants nitrogen in the soil. I love alfalfa. To, as a cover crop. The second part of your question, I'm at a loss for. I spent my whole life on Long Island in New York and my garden was on Long Island in New York. That's a uh, zone seven region. And I'm very familiar with gardening and, and growing there. I'm relatively new to New Hampshire. I've lived here for eight years, but I've never made a garden here. I teach my classes, but I don't do active gardening. And this is a zone five area. So I'm sure there's a, a, a difference in consideration. And I don't know if that means I could grow alfalfa on Long Island, but I can't grow it here. I don't know if the cold will prevent alfalfa from growing as a cover. I'm sorry, I just don't know that. I have no firsthand experience with it. I'd suggest, by the way, to try to be helpful, check out the, the cover crop mixes from all the, the garden supply companies. Almost all of them have got, sell cover crop mixes. And see if you can find some with alfalfa for our area. If, if interestingly, if you find no mix that has alfalfa in it, I think that's probably because the alfalfa doesn't grow around here. But I, I have no firsthand experience, so I can't help you. Sorry. That's the best I could do. Okay. Um, I don't see any other questions, but if anyone has any questions, um, we still have a little time and you're more than welcome to add them into the chat box. Um, okay. I could, uh, I, could, I could easily spend the time talking <laughs> about industrial agriculture, <laughs> but not so crazy like I did before. Uh, you know, this... Oh, oh we have this another question. Given, one second. <laughs> okay. This industrial agriculture has given us so much food and it's so productive. It's like, it is, it is a miracle, the productivity that comes from industrial techniques in agriculture. 
The problem is the end result, the product they give you is worthless, but they sure do make a lot of it. Okay. Okay. And then um, your question is, where do you, um, where to get garlic to start growing? Just like there are seed companies, there are garlic supply companies. When I had my garden, I used to buy a lot of garlic and I bought it in conjunction with a few other farmers. And I would place a large garlic order with a company in Canada because they had the best prices and they had great garlic. So uh, I would buy it from Canada, they would ship it down to me and then us four or five farmers would split it up among ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> Seed catalogs, many of them I'm noticing now sell garlic. High mowing seeds, uh, Johnny seeds, uh, uh, Baker Creek heirloom seeds. I'm not sure if they sell garlic or not, but a lot of the standard um, uh, garden, su uh, uh, garden supply companies or farm supply companies now sell garlic and you can get Gar what they call garlic seed. What it is, is it's a clove of garlic and you break it apart. You break the, and it's a bulb of garlic. You break the bulb apart into cloves and you plant each clove separately. Um, it should not be hard to get it. Talking about planting garlic, you got, there's, there are two types of, two garlic families. One family called soft neck garlic, another family called hard neck garlic. Soft neck garlic, uh, very productive, and that's the one that you see when you see the garlic braided and on display. Uh, that's soft neck garlic, and uh, it's fine. It grows, it's fine. Uh, personally, I didn't grow soft neck garlic. I like hard neck garlic. I like hard neck garlic because the, cl the cloves in the hard neck garlic are much larger. So you could uh, get varieties of hard neck garlic that have maybe six cloves in a bulb of garlic. Uh, that same size bulb in the soft neck garlic might have... Uh, 10 or 12 or 13 cloves, because they're all smaller. So I, I just stayed away from uh, soft neck because I, I didn't want the small stuff. I wanted the large stuff and it's abundant. It's very common. There's all different kinds. I first started out planting garlic. I planted every kind of garlic I could find in the catalog. And then I found out my customers Oh, this garlic is too hot. I don't like, oh, this garlic is not hot enough. It's ridiculous. And so I found a middle of the road garlic, a garlic that most people liked. It was hot, but not crazy hot. It was mild, but not crazy mild, not harmlessly mild. Uh, the variety that I chose and only planted is called music. Uh, there are other similar varieties of hard neck garlic. I think Red Russian is very similar. Uh, white German, White German, I'm sure, is very similar. There are varieties of, of garlic that are in the mid-range with big, large cloves, and that's what I was after. Uh, um, it worked well for me, and I'd be good conscience to recommend it to you, that system. But if you like to weave the garlic or you like to display it or sell it that way, Take your choice. Uh, Jim says that there is a place called Two Toad Farm in Berwick, and he says that they actually sell garlic for seeding and that it's really awesome garlic. So that's a, a good place to. Yeah, I'm, I, I, I don't know the people personally who run Two Toad Farm, but I know they're there and I know what they're doing. And the, I, I have no doubt that's an organic farm and I have no doubt that they sell great garlic legitimately. Um, Lori says she um, 
moved to Dover from a rural area, but neighbors have advised against an open compost area near my border that I was going to build. So I purchased one of those black rotating bins that you have to turn. But in the winter, of course, all the food scraps have frozen, so I couldn't use it. Um, so she wants to know, how do you suggest um, urban Dover folk compost? The problem with compost is it could get to be untidy and that upsets some people. Uh, the rotating drum that you bought is the perfect solution to that problem. And that rotating drum will give you compost 10 times faster than what I described to you by putting it on the ground in layers and turning. That drum makes compost very fast. So it has some advantages. Um, personally, I, I never used it because I had plenty of space and nobody bothered me about, about you know, what I was doing. So I never got into the, the drum thing. I, th I always thought it was unnecessary. For me, in my circumstance, it might be the key for you and yours. And I guess in the wintertime, it, it's, it's, it's uh, neutralized. You can't use it because of the temperature. Okay. Um, oh, Mary says that um, Wentworth Greenhouse also has seed garlic, so there's another place to look for Good. your garlic. Um, and Sandra suggested with the industrial ag agriculture, if you're interested in learning more, there's a Netflix show called Kiss the Ground. She said, um, it's great and very opening about the scary things about how um, our food is produced and how to make things better. What is it called? Um, Kiss the Ground. Kiss the Ground. I want to note it because I want to <laughs> see it. Okay. Thank you for that, Mary. Okay. So we are a little past eight, so we're going to wrap things up now. Um, but thank you so much, Vince. Don't cry, and everybody. <laughs> I, I'm crying because I could do this all night long. Vince but. will be back um, for the next two Wednesdays at six o'clock if you haven't signed up yet. Um, there's two more organic gardening courses. Um, you do have to sign up for them individually. Signing up for one does not mean that you're signing up for all of them. If you're not able to make one, again, we are putting, we are recording these and putting these up on our YouTube page. Um, in the meantime, when you guys take off, there should be a little um, page that comes up with a survey. If you have time and you can, um, please review that survey and let us know what you thought of the presentation and what other um, things that we can provide for you guys in terms of virtual um, entertainment um, to kind of help you guys get through it until COVID-19 is over. Um, so, Do you want to remind them about my book? Please? Oh yes, oh yes, and a reminder, Vince's book is going to be for sale at the library, so at the adult circulation desk, that desk on the second floor, um, it'll be $25 um, for a book. The title of the book is How to Grow a Vegetable Garden That Cannot Fail. And I stand by that, because <laughs> if you do it the way I'm telling you, it cannot fail. Okay, perfect. Green for a green day. Okay. <laughs> Good night, everyone, and thank you so much for attending. Good night, and thank you all. Okay, bye. bye, -bye.